Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Monday's UCD's Institute of Food and Health Research Bites. So our talk today is going to be in the area of old germplasm, its characterization and potential for changing the food uh, system. So we have um, Colin McCabe is going to give uh, his presentation today. And just by way of background, um, where he grew up is very relevant to his talk. Uh, having grown up on a tillage farm in Meath, he then did his PhD in old agronomy and genetics at the UCD Lions Farm. And just recently, he has been appointed as a lecturer in crop science in UCD. He's going to talk to us today about some of his work um, that he did as a postdoc on a healthy oats project. So this is a large collaborative project. It's led by Professor Fiona Doon in UCD. And uh, UCD is working in collaboration with Swansea University and Aberystwyth in Wales. The key aims of the project are to identify agronomic and nutritional traits in heritage and diverse oat varieties that will contribute to climatic, nutritional and agronomic sustainability as production systems change in the future. So uh, Carl is going to talk to us um, about his specific interest in this project, which is on the phenotyping, the nutritional and the grain milling quality. So over to you, the floor is yours, Carl. Thanks, Dolores. I presume everyone can hear me there pretty well. Just, just yeah. Oh, yeah, anyway. yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So Dolores pretty much covered what, I, what the Healthy Oath Project is fairly well there. And I suppose the angle that I've taken on it today in terms of this presentation is to really focus on the diversity that exists and that whole idea of why that diversity is important. And then how we're going about characterizing it in terms of looking at what we have, how that looks in terms of its grain quality, in terms of its yield, in terms of its yield performance. And then the potential to bring some of these varieties back in or certain aspects of these varieties back into current plant breeding or even into current production in order to it i suppose in order to mitigate some of the challenges that are coming down the road at us in terms of growing crops in ireland okay so dolores covered some of this there in her introduction but what the healthy oak project is essentially it's an eu funded initiative by the, it's kind of it's interreg funding between Ireland and Wales, and the key focus of the project is really on optimizing oat production systems, and also the role that oats can play in, in human nutrition. But really, how this whole research project is framed, really in terms of my part of it, which was agronomic yield trials and mitigating climate change, it's all really framed by the farm to fork strategy are the changes that are proposed under the farm to fork strategy. So there's this big target here, which is a 50% reduction in pesticide inputs, which in itself is quite a challenge in an Irish climate. We're also talking about reducing nutrient losses by up to 50%. What's more important within that, it's the 50% nutrient losses, but it is actually a 20% reduction in how much fertilizer we're going to be able to use. And in terms of what's relevant to, act, to crop production, I should say, there is this forecasted or desired increase in the area of organic organic production in Ireland and in the EU as well. And you'd actually find what we found in this project is just that there's been a lot of engagement. There's actually a photo in this presentation in relation to it. We've had a lot of engagement from organic farmers. And the reason for that is that if you're in organic production, depending on what part of the country you're in, organic oats is actually really the most profitable enterprise you can you can you can put on that farm. You're talking about price premiums of maybe 60 or 70 euro above the price of wheat, which in the last year was a pretty lucrative market to be in. And yeah, so in the context of the EU Green Deal, as I mentioned there, there is guideline reductions of 20% in terms of our nutrients, in terms of the nutrients we're going to be allowed to apply, and 50% in terms of pesticides. And what we're trying to do in healthy oats is by looking at how much diversity there is within the oat population for different traits, try to see can we bring back some of these traits in to help us to manage some of these reductions or to manage a scenario where we've got reduced options available to us in terms of pest control. And yeah, in terms of then the human health aspect of it, which is more to another work package, but there is a certain element of it that I cover. So there is this famous and really important verification that oats are very heavily linked with improved human health. 
And oats do contain the highest levels of protein and oils in most cereal crops. But what's particularly relevant, I suppose, in plant breeding over the past 30 years, maybe, or 40 years, is that there's been this big focus on improved grain yield. So even on the Irish recommended list at the moment, if you're going to put a variety into trial, the number one trait of key importance is yield. So you might have a variety that's very, very good on almost every trait, like protein and oil, beta-glucan, things like that. But if it doesn't make the bar on yield, or if it's not making an average yield, then it's not continued any further. So what's happened over time is that there's been less of a focus on specific aspects of grain quality. And instead, there's been this massive interest in improving grain yield, often to the detriment of the other important characteristics. So what we're trying to do in healthy oats is, again, to go back in time, so to speak, and try and look at varieties from a different era that might be able, that might, I suppose, act as reservoirs of certain genes for current day plant breeding and, and it's helping us to manage some of the changes that are coming at us. So yeah, in terms of what kind of germplasm is, so germplasm is a very scientific word that I don't particularly like myself a lot at the time, but essentially what germplasm is, is it's just variation, or it's just seeds, it's just variation in different seeds. So you see there, that's actually a photo in the background from the trial we had in lines last year. And if I can draw your attention to some of it, you'll see over here, we've got what's actually a black oak. You can see the growth themselves are black. Over here, you see quite a conventional looking short white oak. But over in the background there, you can see oats. Oh, There's a golden one here, a white one here. You see big variation in terms of heights, in terms of grain color. They're kind of the more physical, simple differences you can look at. But then when you go further, you see these big differences in terms of grain proteins, disease resistance, and things like that. So there is a lot of variation that exists in populations and trying to identify certain aspects or certain traits in different varieties that we can use was a key focus of the project. So a quick introduction to what we're working with. So in UCD, there was a collection of 190 varieties assembled, and these varieties were assembled from seed banks and from reservoirs all over the world, essentially, mainly Europe. You'll see it in, the, in a minute on a different slide, but it's mainly North, or Western Europe, Northern Europe, where oats are predominantly grown. There's a couple of varieties from the USA as well. There's also 56 varieties from a Welsh collection in Aberystwyth, or the Institute of Biological and Environmental and Rural Sciences in, in Wales. They're a key collaborator on the project. And these varieties are from a very wide, her are from a very wide genetic background. And there's a huge amount of phenotypic and gene genetic diversity within this population. And what I found really, really cool, even and by chance, if any of you are familiar with the, with I suppose the, what we would call, I think it's I'm not, I have to be careful how I say this, but it's the the lab on the first floor, the lab that's used by crop science and horticulture students. Up on the wall there, you'll actually see that there was a plant breeding in the Royal Albert College, which preceded the ag, the ag faculty in UCD back in back at one point in time, you'll actually see that some of the varieties that we're working with now in lines are were actually bred back in the Royal Albert College. So it's a really nice little backstory to this whole project as well. So I mentioned that was, again, that's both the purpose of that photo is really to show just how much diversity there is in the field. So you'll see over here, there's quite a tall variety, but you'll also see differences in terms of ripening. Some of them are more golden than others. So there really is quite a wide, it's really, 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 really interesting to see just how different oat varieties can be across any number of traits, whether it's height, color, disease resistance, never mind getting into things like grain quality. And what's really, really cool is that in the past, and there is this kind of relationship, and I mentioned it as plant breeders focused on yield, they did they did drift away from traits like grain quality, but there's also the fact that technology has improved so much in terms of detecting grain quality in recent years. But that technology actually wasn't available to people as they were making these initial selections. So it is really cool to go back and characterize these varieties and see what exactly they had at that point in time. So this is a really important part of the work and it's, it's a part of it that people really, really seem to like and are really particularly interested in. So what we're looking at here is essentially the, it's not so important the specifics of it, but it's more important to look at the eras or each section of this pie chart here represents a different era or that's the way I like to think of it anyway. So here we've got pre-1930, pre-1950, pre-1980, modern varieties. And then this really important section here, which is a land race. What land race varieties are, is that they're actually selections from the wild. So they're selections that were made, they're varieties essentially that weren't developed intentionally by humans. So they develop themselves in their wild environment. And what often happens in these land races is that you get really, really, really interesting 
examples of local adaptation to different environments because there's been no active selection made on these. But what is also really, really cool, I think, in my, or well, I find it very cool anyway, is that if we look at these ears and I've, I've branched them off into those sections intentionally. So the big, I suppose, if you, they're nearly in terms of the different, the different big advances that were made in crop production. So pre-1930, these were varieties that I suppose were selected for a period where artificial inputs like fertilizers, fertilizers and pesticides and things like that weren't on the scene or they weren't invented. So these varieties were bred, bred to be grown in, a, in an environment where these pesticides and these fertilizers weren't actually available. Then we've got pre-1950. So again, after World War II, that's when essentially chemical inputs became widely, widely used and widely available. Big factories in Central Europe were left. Big factories in Central Europe were left and they began producing agro agrochemicals and agricultural inputs. So that was the big advance at that stage. Then we move into the 1980s, which is when things again got more specialized in terms of our ability to manage yields and things like that. Or essentially when European policy moved into producing a high, very high yields. Then we've got this area called modern varieties. So even within these sections, even within this area of modern varieties here, we have varieties from Ireland, we've got varieties from the UK, we've got varieties from Germany, Spain, and places like that. So even within, within these time-based selections. There's also a lot of genetic or geographical diversity there as well. And that's what we're looking at in terms of where these varieties are coming from. So we see a small number from the USA, and you will see that the countries that tend to grow the most, so most oats, I should say, excuse me, namely Western Europe and the Scandinavian countries, they're the countries which have over time preserved their, their older varieties in order to go back to them over time. So we're looking to see how these diverse varieties perform under Irish climatic conditions. So in terms of what we've done so far in the field, so the first thing we had to do essentially, so when we got the seeds out of these seed banks all over the world, they were a very low quantity. So what we actually had to do at the start of the project was we had to bulk these seeds up. So this involved us putting, putting these trials, putting these seeds in the field in order to try and harvest the quantity of seed back in order to start doing larger field plots and things like that. That actually gave us a really, really nice opportunity at that stage. So while we had the 190 varieties or the full UCD collection in the field at that stage, it actually allowed us to screen out some of the varieties we knew we weren't going to be interested in. Oats have this awful tendency because they tend to grow quite tall. And for people who aren't familiar with it, what happens is the oats will essentially fall over onto the ground and it makes it very, very difficult to harvest. And as well as that, when it gets to harvest, when you've got a crop that's kind of lying close to the ground, you've actually got a very practical issue of things like clay, stones, and even glass, depending on how close you are to a main road. They can actually make their way into the machine and you can kind of have this indirect contamination effect. So being able to weed out some of the, being able to select some of the varieties that we definitely weren't interested in at that stage was really, really important. So the next two trials are on, or the next three trials, I should say, are ongoing. So we are doing this genetic characterization of the oat population. And so what this essentially involves is that we go out and we are currently evaluating all the different characteristics that we can evaluate. So plant height, grain quality, grain protein, kernel content, beta gluten, things like that. We're doing a full phenotypic evaluation of these varieties. And then we're going to carry out a genome-wide study in order to develop or to identify if there's links in that, if there's links there that we can exploit. What's really, really important, again, within these varieties, so we, what we've found is that some of these varieties that we're working with are really, really high in different traits, okay? So they're very, some of them are very high in beta-glucan, some of them are very high in protein. What's really, really important is that if we're going to recommend these varieties as a good source of a grain protein trait or a good source of a, or a good source of a, of a kernel content trait, we need to really trial that trait, look at that trait across different environments. So what we so what's been going on every year is that we've got one trial out here in Lines, we've got another trial with, with collaborators in Chagas down in Oak Park in Carlow, and then we actually have two trials over in Aberystwyth in Wales. And over there, they've actually got a trial at I think it's a site that's six or seven hundred meters above sea level. So it's really really cool to be able to find this collaboration, to be able to look at these varieties in really really different environments. And that's the big thing in growing crops in any year is that the weather has such a massive effect on how they perform. We've also got this other really important trial going on as well, which is in relation to screening varieties for their resistance to powdery mildew. So what really is the biggest 
challenge for Irish crop producers in terms of the farm to fork strategy is that big reduction in pesticide input. So they're looking for a 50% reduction. So really where a lot of, in terms of, an, in an Irish context, I should say, the bulk of what we use as pesticides is to do with fungal disease control. So what we're trying, powdery mildew is the main fungal disease that affects oats in any given season in Ireland. So trying to identify good sources of resistance, of natural resistance to powdery mildew is really, really advantageous to us and will help us move towards meeting that, meeting that aspirational target. And this is a slide that I really like, and whenever we slow, show it, we tend to get quite good engagement on it. So these are the varieties that we've selected across, to try and across those, across those environments, excuse me. So you'll actually see that this variety, Sandy, that variety was actually relate, released in 1850. So almost 170 years, it is 170 years ago when that variety was released. And we see in these older varieties is that they're not always that functional. They tend to be quite tall and they can be quite difficult to harvest, but they have this really, these really, really high, they've got a very high level of protein. They've got a very high level of beta gluten in some cases, and particularly oil as well. So they really do have, a, they're a very, they act as a very good reservoir or the other way of looking at it is a very good source of traits that we might be able to select for, for, modern, for modern production systems. Again, you'll see a variety that was actually bred in the Royal Albert College, Glass Devon Major, again, released in 1930. And what we're trying to do here is that we select these varieties for different reasons. Some of these varieties, Sandy's very good on protein, Glass Devon Major, very good on protein as well. We've also got Storm and Arrow, which was likely bred up in the north of the country. And you'll see that these varieties, they are very good. They're very high for certain traits that we're very interested in. And so what we're trying to do in this, in this research project is we're really trying to establish what the varieties are like in terms of their field performance and all, their, and all the aspects of that. And then in order that we can put them or recommend them as useful sources of material for plant breeders moving into the future. And yeah, just to go back to it again, like this idea of strict trade stability is crucially important because if we're trying to develop markets for old products, we need varieties that can consistently meet that spec. There's no point in us basing our results off one year. We're all very familiar with it, but there's no, it's very risky for us to base our results or base our recommendations off one trial in one field. It really needs to, really needs to be able to perform consistently across a wide area. If you're going to recommend to millers or to companies interested in it, that this is a variety that's worth them taking a bet on, essentially. And then moving to these, so then moving into our grain yields. So I focused here on those varieties across that multi-location trial. And what I've highlighted in red is actually the control varieties, okay? So they're the modern day control varieties that we grow in Ireland and Wales in any given year. So you'll see that generally speaking, the control varieties are yielding the highest. There is this other variety over here which yielded exceptionally well. This was in the, the UCD trial last year. It's not the mean of all the sites. I didn't, couldn't have get that data in time for today. But the key point of this slide is that these more modern varieties, they do tend to be higher yielding. Okay, that's due to selection over time. That was the key target. So when people were making decisions on how they were improving their own varieties, the key factor they were determined to improve with grain yield. Okay? And we see that coming through, like the highest the control varieties here, Timpani, Timpani and Conway, and with the exception of this one over here, it's a coded variety, they do yield the highest. So modern varieties do tend to be much higher yielding than older varieties. And that, that's true across not only the oats, but in terms of wheat, barley, rye, or any crop you look at, that's, that's, been, the, that's been the result of plant breeding, essentially. And then in terms of kernel content, so kernel content is really, really important because oats is a little bit different than, than wheat or barley. And the reason for that is that oats actually have a husk. So they've actually got a shell. And in order to start making products with oats, in order to produce the porridge, there's actually a step, quite an intensive step between the field and your breakfast table, essentially. So there's a very intensive process that goes on that involves knocking the shells or knocking the inner valuable growth section out of the outer shell. And we see that while the modern varieties are relatively high, you don't see that same massive bias, I suppose, more the more modern varieties. There's the older material does compete with it quite successfully. And in many cases can actually be higher, even though statistically they're all quite similar there. But again, another really important one. So this is growth oil, or this is oil in terms of oats refers to fats, basically. So it's here is that the modern varieties, the two that are really important in Ireland are actually Barra and Husky. 
they're the two varieties that we were, are the most widely grown. There's a new one after coming out in recent years called Isabel. I actually didn't have it in this trial this year. But you'll see that a lot of this older material, if we look at Sandy down here, it's the highest in the trial. So you see Sandy, that variety released in 1850. That variety has an oil content that's you know, quite significantly higher than the two modern control varieties we're growing in Ireland at the moment. You also see certain other varieties, see Glass Nevin Major, in the same range in terms of oil, just lower yielding. But the really important point is that some of these older varieties, while they do have issues in other ways, while they're not perfect and maybe we wouldn't grow them out in the field straight away this year, but they do have valuable genes that have been kind of left behind by modern selection that we can bring back in in order to try and improve, try and improve the, the overall nutritional profile of the variety we're growing. Then in terms of protein, you see quite a dramatic shift. And this is this has been, and it's a widely known relationship in, in cereals, particularly in Ireland, that as yield increases of any crop, the grain protein content tends to be reduced as a result. So what you actually see is that the varieties that were highest yielding are controlled varieties are actually the lowest in terms of grain protein. And again, we look at that, these varieties, Storm and Darrow was released in 1938. That's substantially 4% higher protein, more or less, than our modern varieties. You see the same with Sandy, same, same with Maldwin as well. So we see that these older varieties, while they aren't particularly high yielding, maybe in certain seasons, they do have this really, really high grain protein, really, really interesting nutritional characteristics that I suppose we're trying to exploit slightly in terms of market diversification and oats and things like that. And I mentioned there, so the other key part of the work, sorry, no, I didn't skip the slide. So the other key part of the of my work package in terms of healthy oats was this natural resistance to plant pathogens, okay? So when we're talking about pesticide inputs in crops in Ireland, what generally the key, I, I would guess there's no real figures on this. And <laughs> there's no real figures on it, but I would guess if I was to put a figure on it, that 60 to 70% of the pesticides used in Ireland on a cereal crop are used to control fungal plant diseases. In extreme cases in wheat, for example, yield losses can be 30 to 40%, depending on what pathogen you're dealing with. So in oats, the key pathogen that we're targeting with fungicide applications is powdery mildew. And we are, our plant breeders are very familiar and farmers and agronomists are very familiar with this whole idea of natural resistance. But what we've actually seen in recent years is that we might get one or two or three really good years out of a resistance gene. What happens then, I suppose inevitably, is that that plant resistance gene breaks, it's no longer effective against the population we're trying to control. And as a result, we're back to square one in terms, and again, we're back relying on our, back relying on pesticides to solve our disease problems for us. So what we're trying to do, I suppose, I like to think it's in quite a smart way, is that we're trying to predict how some of these origins might break down, might break down in the future. And how we're doing that is that, I suppose, we're trying to bring the natural variation in powdery mildew that exists in the field, we're trying to bring that into the glass house in order to see the, the powdery mildew resistance genes that we've identified in our overall population, to see if they're effective against this whole range of isolates from different parts of the country. And yes, yeah, so just to talk you through some of the sites, so this is actually down in Waterford at the Seed Tech trial site, just outside Waterford City near Dunmore East. Then you've got an isolate from Oak Park in Carlo. We've got one from Lyons here in South Dublin, and we've got one from our home farm, my own home farm here in County Mead. And so what we're trying to do is that we assume that there is differences genetically between a powdery mildew from Waterford and a powdery mildew from County Mead. And we're trying to see through the resistance genes that we've identified are varieties that look like they're displaying resistance in the field. See this, this res that this resistance perform the same against a wide range of isolates, okay? And what's really important to know is that even at a very basic level, and this is, well, it's not so much a basic level maybe, but how we started this was that we had two field trials with the overall oat population, those full 190 lines. And what we noticed was that in certain seasons, some varieties were highly resistant. They had no detectable symptoms of powdery mildew, but in another season, they had quite a high, they had quite a high level of powdery mildew infection on them. And they're the examples of them. They're the extreme examples that we looked at. So if you look at Canyon here, which would be known to be quite a resistant variety, in 2021, we saw no powdery mildew infection. But in 2022, we saw quite a high level. So there was something 
either that the resistance in the variety was failing in terms of it was starting to break down, or else there was a slight shift in the genetics of the disease that enabled the disease itself to overcome it in a different year. So what we were trying to do here was to see, was there, why, was it a difference in the variety that led to that difference in the disease infection, or was there a, was there a change in the genetics of the, of the disease? And what we see, this is just, again, this is just a, the same, that last slide portrayed a different way. See that in certain seasons, we had absolutely no disease infection on certain varieties. Some of the varieties were very strong. Yukon would be known to be quite resistant, didn't display any powdery mildew symptoms in any season. And again, this variety from the 1850s, Sandy, again, no powdery mildew infection observed on that. So in both seasons, it displayed a really, really high level of resistance. But it's the varieties that are doing the opposite that we're concerned about. So if we were to look at Canyon as a source of disease resistance for powdery mildew, we might be quite disappointed in terms of how it would perform. So what we are assuming is that there's a slight issue with Canyon or that maybe its resistance is beginning to break down. So what we're planning to do is that by bringing mildew strains from different parts of the country to these varieties and assessing how they perform, we're able to make strong recommendations in terms of, yes, that variety is a really good source of powdery mildew resistance across a range of environments. And that's what we saw. So that was a mead, that was the ice that from County Mead. And again, it's more or less the same relationship as the last slide. We see a slight disease infection on Sandy, but again, in terms of the overall disease infection that we observed, it was quite low. But again, some of these varieties, if I was to pick this Kex Methi here, that variety displayed a full resistance in the trials in, UC, in lines. But then when we used an isolate from our home farm in County Mead, we saw a total breakdown in terms of that resistance and a really high level of disease infection. So what we're trying to do in the key focus of this whole study is really focusing on trying to identify sources of disease resistance or powdery mildew resistance that are going to perform really reliably in the field. Then in terms of future plans, so these are more or less the trials from 20, trial plans for 2023. So in line again with that farm to fork strategy, the big trial plan for this year is to look at how these range of oak varieties will perform in different nutrient input scenarios. And I would assume that they might perform quite well, because as I mentioned in that slide that looked at all the different release dates and how some of those varieties were essentially selected for varieties where chemical inputs weren't weren't didn't exist at that point in time, I would expect that some of these mod these older varieties, I should say, will actually be quite well adapted to those lower input type scenarios. As well as that, so I mentioned there that we have this variety, we have the resistance screening completed in terms of the mildew isolate from our own farm. And we're going to start moving that in. We're going to start looking at the other isolates from the different locations in the country as well. And it's also in collaboration with Dolores. We're also going to begin processing larger quantities of oats. We're going to start dehulling them ourselves. We've recently got the machine, which is great. And we're going to start looking at, and it's not so much my, I might be involved in selecting the varieties that we recommend for growing in the field. We passed it on to our collaborators in a different work package, and they begin looking at product development for niche markets and things like that. And that's so the people involved in this part of the project are myself, then Dr. Angela Deacon, Professor Fiona Doon leads the project, and then also Chan and Farhan are involved in the project as well. In terms of our collaborators, then you'll see it is quite a list. We've got Dolores, Amalia, Andre, and Pooja in UCD and different work packages. Over in Aberystwyth in Wales, we've got Dr. Catherine Howard and John Doonan. Also in Swansea University, they're looking more at um, Andrea might talk a little bit about that when she gives this presentation, when she gives her presentation, but they're looking at trialing oats in terms of human nutrition. And also in Chagas as well, we're collaborating with Dr. Atikur Raman. So thanks for listening, guys, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you might have.